reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me thus, Gird your loins, stand up and tell them all that I command you. Be not crushed on their account, as though I would leave you crushed before them. For it is I this day who have made you a fortified city, a pillar of iron, a wall of brass, against the whole land, against Judah's kings and princes, against its priests and people. They will fight against you, but not prevail over you. For I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Verbum Domini. I will sing your salvation. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue me and deliver me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge, a stronghold to give me safety. For you are my rock and my fortress. O my God, rescue me from the hand of the wicked. For you are my hope, O Lord, my trust, O God, from my youth. On you I depend from birth. From my mother's womb, you are my strength. My mouth shall declare your justice, and day by day your salvation. O God, you have taught me from my youth. Until the present, I proclaim your wondrous deeds. Dominus vobiscum, Lectio Sancti Evangelii secundum Marcum. Herod was one who had John the Baptist arrested and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip whom he had married. John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias harbored a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but was unable to do so. Herod feared John, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man and kept him in custody. When he heard him speak, he was very much perplexed, yet he liked to listen to him. She had an opportunity one day when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers, his military officers, and the leading men of Galilee. Herodias's own daughter came in and performed a dance that delighted Herod and his guests. The king said to the girl, Ask of me whatever you wish, and I will grant it to you. He even swore many things to her, 
I will grant you whatever you ask of me, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? She replied, the head of John the Baptist. The girl hurried back to the king's presence and made her request. I want you to give me at once on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was deeply distressed, but because of his oaths and the guest, he did not wish to break his word to her. So he promptly dispatched an executioner with orders to bring back his head. He went off and beheaded him in the prison. He brought in the head on a platter and gave it to the girl. The girl in turn gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Verbum Domini. Today in the gospel, we hear the martyrdom of John the Baptist. For centuries, the church has placed great emphasis on the person and the mission of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was Christ's herald. He was the forerunner of Christ that announced and prepared the way for the Lord. John the Baptist was the first man to be martyred for the sake of Christ. His martyrdom was unique to any other Christian martyr because he shed his blood before Christ shed his blood. In every way, John the Baptist prepared the way for Christ, even foreshadowing the passion and death of the Lord. King Herod, in hearing that the fame of Jesus was spreading, became infuriated. Anything that was a threat to his power and his authority enraged him. It was proposed to him that John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. That this man, Jesus, was John the Baptist, whom he had earlier beheaded. King Herod was the wealthiest man in all of Judea. He had every material possession that he can possibly want, but he lacked one thing. He lacked a clear conscience. He lacked peace with God. He knew he had done wrong. Herod's conscience convicted him of the murder of John the Baptist. St. Bede the Venerable in a ninth, in a ninth century homily on St. John the Baptist said this, St. John gave his life for Christ. He was ordered, that is ordered by King Herod, to deny Christ, but was ordered to keep silent about the truth. Again, let me say that again. I think I said that incorrectly. He was not ordered, that is ordered by King Herod to deny who Christ was, that he existed, but was ordered to keep silent about the truth. In other words, he was ordered to be tight-lipped. Don't say anything. To keep silent about King Herod's sin of unlawful marriage to his brother Philip Herodias, Philip's wife Herodias. John the Baptist's whole existence was to point out and to prepare the way for the truth to be accepted. He would not keep silent about the truth. His whole life became a testimony to the truth. 
Pope St. John Paul II said in Veritatis Splendor, the splendor of truth, he says, at the, tr at the dawn of the New Testament, John the Baptist, unable to refrain from speaking the law of the Lord and rejecting any compromise with evil, gave his life in witness to truth and justice and thus became the forerunner of the Messiah in the way he died. The one who came to bear witness to the light and who deserved to be called by that same light, which is Christ, a burning and shining lamp, was cast into the darkness of a prison. John was called by Jesus this shining light, and he was cast into a prison, the darkness of a prison, for speaking the truth. He was snuffed out. The one to whom it was granted to baptize the Redeemer of the world was thus baptized in his own blood by his martyrdom. The life and death of St. John the Baptist is a call to repentance and conversion. He was a life and he lived a life of no compromise. He did not compromise the truth in face of opposition. To him, the truth was too valuable. It was too sacred to bend or to askew to one's own needs. To compromise the truth was to compromise God and his relationship with God. When it comes down to it, Truth is truth, and it cannot be compromised in any situation, period. Truth is truth and can never be compromised. The account of the martyrdom of St. John the Baptist reminds us and impels us as Christians and all people of goodwill that we cannot compromise the truth in any way. The truth of revelation and also the truth of the natural law, the law that God has written on our hearts. We cannot bend the truth, but what needs to happen is that our wills need to be bent in accordance with the truth. Our wills need to be conformed to the truth. Compromise is nothing more than a lie. Jesus did not say, I am the way, the compromise, and the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. St. John the Baptist was not afraid to call out error in the public and civil realm. His voice cleared the path and made room for the voice of Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Again, he called out the unlawful marriage of Herod, of Herodias, and his, bro and his wife's brother Philip. And in doing so, he was beheaded for the truth, especially the truth of the sacredness and dignity of marriage. Think for a moment how John the Baptist would be the voice to defend the life of the unborn child in today's world. The most vulnerable and the most poorest and I dare say the most targeted among us. The unsafest. The womb should be the safest place in this world for a child. And it has become the target for many. It's a self-evident issue that protection of the unborn is not just a religious issue. It's the greatest civil rights issue 
in all of history. Nothing even comes close to this. Nothing comes close to the Holocaust of abortion. It's the preeminent issue of our times. And I'd like to share with you some startling facts about the unborn child in the womb. And we need to hear the truth of reality. And yes, even the truth of science. Science is a good thing. Who do you think ushered in the scientific method in teaching of science in universities? It was the Catholic Church, first of all, who ushered in and supported science. Let these truths, really, of medical science, and every day they are presenting more and more data, which is true, let these truths kind of sink in and kind of startle us this morning. When does the unborn child's heart begin to beat? 18 days after conception. And by 21 days, the heart is pumping blood through a closed circulatory system. When can the unborn child's brain waves be detected? Six weeks after conception. When do fingerprints appear on the unborn child's hands? 14 weeks. When can the unborn child feel pain? By nine weeks. By nine weeks from conception, all the structures necessary for pain sensation are functioning. Wow. Here are some other milestones of the unborn child's development in the womb of his mother or her mother. At four weeks from conception, a baby's eye, ear, and respiratory systems begin to form. Thumb sucking has been documented from seven weeks from conception. At eight weeks from conception, a baby's heartbeat can be detected by an ultrasonic stethoscope. At eight weeks, Everything is present in an adult human that is now present in an unborn child. At eight weeks, everything is present in an adult human is now present in the child in the womb. At eight weeks, the bones are beginning to form, the muscles can contract, the facial features continue to mature, the eyelids are now more developed, and the baby is about one inch long and is the size of a bean. By nine weeks from conception, a baby is able to bend her fingers around an object in her hand. By 11 to 12 weeks from conception, the baby is breathing fluid steadily and continues to do so until birth. And by 11 weeks from conception, a baby can now swallow. Between 13 and 15 weeks from conception, a baby's taste buds are present and functioning. At 20 weeks and perhaps as early as 16 weeks from her conception, a baby is capable of hearing his mother's heartbeat, and external voices or noises like music from the outside. At 23 weeks from conception, babies have been shown to demonstrate rapid eye movements, which are characteristic of active dream states. At six months from conception, a baby's oil and sweat glands are functioning. 
At seven months from conception, a baby frequently exercises in preparation for birth by kicking and stretching. Mothers, you know this. At eight months from conception, a baby's skin begins to thicken and the child swallows a gallon of amniotic fluid each day. A baby swallows eight, a gallon of amniotic fluid each day and often hiccups. This can be detected by ultrasound, by science. During the ninth month from conception, a baby gains about a half a pound a week, per week. For us, the daily living of the Christian life means a life of no compromise. The truth is the truth, and a lie is a lie, period. There is no getting around it. Being a Christian demands a daily martyrdom, again, to conform our lives, to bend our lives, to bend our wills to the truth, to the truth of revelation and to the truth of the natural law. Being a Christian means to allow Christ to grow within us, to allow him to influence our thoughts, and our actions. With the national presidential elections in the United States coming so close, we have a serious moral obligation to elect candidates who will promise to do everything in their power to protect and safeguard the life of the unborn child. We cannot compromise. We cannot live a life in, in error and a lie. Our lives must be conformed to the truth. We need to be that voice that speaks and yes, votes for that child that can't vote, the unborn child in the womb. We live in a world that follows the gospel of compromise, the gospel of error. We cannot and we will not compromise the gospel of Jesus Christ. Never. Never can we compromise the gospel for a lie. Our lives must be completely conformed to the truth of who God is. And most of all, the truth of God made flesh, the word made flesh in the womb of his mother.